the next panel is on, I, I, ha, having heard a little bit about the different private sector actors, the next panel is actually on innovative finance tools for protecting forests. And we're going to, we've got, we've got four panellists here to talk about different ideas that they have in terms of protecting forests. Um, can I just ask people to, pay, if you're still talking, just to pay attention, if that's okay? Um, is it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, so, 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 so in this section we're going to hear, hear, hear from four speakers on those topics. Um, but the first thing I want to do is before I ask you to, um, and, and perhaps your answer will be partly in what you present, but the question was raised in the, in the last session and I'm going to up the ante a little bit. I mean, we all know that there is a huge amount of price sector capital in the market. So if I said to you, said to you I've got a billion dollars to invest in red and I want a 5% rate of return, what would your answer be? And if your answer is going to be about what you're going to present on your topic, we'll incorporate that into it. But maybe I'll start, Argus, with you. What what are we going to do with a billion in Indonesia? Is that what on red? That's, is that the question? Well, what's your, if I give you a billion dollars and, and I say I want a five percent return, how are you going to do it? Well, okay. Um, <laughs> Give me that billion. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what. <laughs> well, uh, God. Okay. Um, here, Landscape Indonesia is uh, uh, is a company that bridges a uh, 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 finance with uh, sustainable landscape management. So my um, my um, my um, answer obviously is uh, that I'm going to put it in a landscape management. And that means basically a, a, a space in which there's conservation, there's uh, production, all in the same uh, uh, sort of uh, um, um, area. And what, what I'd like to do is to see that both actually produces assets. So the conservation produces um, ecosystem services assets, and in which um, um, obviously carbon being uh, uh, one of them, and for the production uh, uh, portion of landscape, uh, we'll see uh, commodities. And that could be timber, that could be uh, uh, palm, that could be coffee, uh, cacao, um, uh, rubber, and, and the likes. Um, obviously, um, I'd like to see them all sustainably certified. So within that landscape, we'll see not only um, uh, return going back to the investors, but also the components within the landscape be uh, 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 somehow strengthening each other. That should be my short answer. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, I'll probably just continue with my presentation. I should probably use the uh, podium here. Um, thank you very much, um, everybody, for being here. Thank you uh, for APRS, uh, both uh, governments of Indonesia and Australia for doing this. Um, I should probably hold on to this. There you go. Um, landscape, as I, as, um, I did mention, uh, bridges sustainable jurisdictional uh, landscape management with finance. Um, how do we uh, 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 bring that billion, basically, into uh, uh, projects? What I'd like to uh, show you with this very simple diagram is that there are different sources of financing, um, uh, ranging from grants that would come from public private uh, CSR and philanthropies. And then we have um, private investments, public investments. There are public sectors that are doing investments, not only doing grants, um, as well as uh, some sort of innovative financing. And we are probably going to hear uh, from uh, a number of um, other panelists uh, what these innovative financing uh, 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 schemes are. And they could come from both private and public sector. Um, what is also um, uh, uh, seen as the other side of, 
of, of this uh, diagram is a series of uh, basically a portfolio of projects. You have conservation and rehabilitation um, that would basically bring um, uh, 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 ecosystem services assets that uh, we could use. For example, we could retire some of the carbon uh, emissions assets uh, towards um, uh, our national uh, or nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement, um, and also um, for private reti uh, retirement of the assets, a, a number of companies, a number of investors would like to see retired carbon uh, emission uh, credits uh, for their own uh, uh, benefits. And then also other ecosystem mark is ecosystems uh, markets. Um, in addition to carbon, we have seen uh, markets for biodiversity, for water, and um, uh, many others. Um, and also, then, uh, I know the investment um, would um, uh, go towards uh, sustainable commodities. Um, that would uh, go towards uh, commodity markets that you would see um, uh, uh, being um, another reason why they are investors. The idea is basically to mix, to blend all these sources of financing. Um, you don't only depend on investment alone, you don't depend on grants alone, and we have been depending on grants when it comes to f uh, forest financing, and I think we should start thinking about uh, uh, blending the grants with many other uh, investment and financing options. And um, uh, that's, that's what... Uh, so what I'd like to uh, show you is uh, what is emerging right now, which is um, the use of bonds uh, to, uh, to uh, basically to gain uh, um, uh, other sources of financing. Um, bond is, uh, is basically a, a, a statement of uh, uh, debt um, that would be guaranteed. It can be guaranteed by a, by, by a country, by a government through sovereign guarantee. It could be guaranteed by corporate uh, 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 corporations as a corporate guarantee. It could be guaranteed by many other things, by, uh, by, um, by underlying assets, by, by, by pledges. Um, and those guarantees will basically be used to issue bond that would raise funds from bond uh, bond investors. Uh, what we could do is uh, once we get the bond uh, investors invest and we uh, raise funds from the bonds, we could use that uh, asset to, uh, to, to leverage uh, private investors and, uh, and, and, and gain uh, more uh, financing from there. Um, the bond investors, of course, would have uh, different um, interests. Uh, you know, very, very, very common interest would be to gain uh, return. Um, in, terms, in, in bonds, it would be in terms of coupon. Um, they will be basically paid either on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, their coupon. Uh, and uh, the fund um, that's, that's uh, raised through bonds and uh, uh, used uh, uh, as leverage to, uh, to get investors will be, in, uh, will, be, uh, will be invested in projects. A number of uh, bond investors would like to see other returns than cash. Uh, and um, actually, um, uh, Martin's uh, company, um, I believe, advised IFC uh, uh, to, uh, to structure a uh, forest bond that was highly uh, 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 you know, discussed, or heavily discussed last year. It was quite a successful um, uh, uh, bond um, uh, issuance um, in which some of the investors actually would like to see carbon credits being their return instead of cash or in addition to cash and uh, uh, a bond structure can also provide that kind of um, that kind of uh, return so um, uh, this whole thing could um, uh, uh, certainly um, generate uh, enough uh, financing for the, uh, uh, for forest um, uh, and forest uh, restoration, forest conservation, and also um, the re 
reduction of the underlying causes of deforestation, reducing the risks of uh, encroachment and deforestation. Um, there are elements, of course, you know, that need to be uh, 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 um, uh, discussed. Of course, we need to talk about about um, about uh, scale. We have a lot to do. We have a lot of, um, um, of forests to restore. We have a lot of forests to conserve. Um, so we need to have scalable public-private people partnership, and that includes in innovative investments um, that um, would uh, be sustainable, that would sustain for a very long period of time. It has to be open for uh, private sector involvement in a market-based structure, because after all, private sector does need to see a uh, return on their investments. Um, and then scalable pipeline development, including incubation. We are talking about scale. We are talking about a uh, big amount of money and big, uh, 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 a big number of activities to be done. We don't have those activities yet on our table. We need to develop those activities right now. We need to coordinate both the registry system and the monitoring system, the audit system, to ensure that we are talking about the same thing when we are talking about conservation. We are talking about the same thing when we are talking about restoration. Um, and lastly, of course, we need to uh, ensure that the whole financing um, uh, system is uh, uh, safeguarded, both in terms of fiduciary uh, safeguards the money that goes in and goes out need to be completely accountable, and also the social, uh, the social and environmental safeguards that the projects that are financed need to be uh, uh, socially and environmentally acceptable uh, 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 through uh, so, you know certain standards. I think that is pretty much what I have to share with you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Argus. Well, I'm now going to ask, actually, um, I'm going to go in a different order. I'm going to ask Michael Brady from the IFC, um, given Argus commented on bonds, to, to pick up on the bond discussion, um, given your very successful is issuance last year. And there's a microphone just um, in, on the table in front of you. Good morning. My name is Michael Brady. I'm the forestry and wood product uh, program manager for International Finance Corporation. Uh, IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. So we're the sister organization to the World Bank. Uh, we, pr we provide financing to private sector and our colleagues in the bank provide financing and advice to, to governments, the public sector. I'm going to talk to you today about some of the tools for financing. Um, you can see up on the slide, IFC as a, a financing institution, our, our core activity is investment. Um, and I've listed here uh, the variety of investments, uh, tools that we provide to private sector, everything from short-term loans to uh, blended finance, where we, we blend commercial money with concessional finance uh, and are able to, to uh, fund innovative, take more risk with that type of finance. I provide, uh, our, I work in our advisory services where we work with investment teams to provide uh, technical safeguards, uh, sector advice, uh, either before or during an investment. So my background's forestry, and I work with our investment teams uh, on everything from uh, forestry technical issues to our, our safeguards. I 
thought I would start by just going through, and I, I think it would be helpful to, to sort of lay the, the a foundation of uh, financing understanding. This is our, our core activity in IFC and the forestry and wood product sector is what we, we call the real, the real sector. So we, we provide financing to a very wide range along the value chain of from upstream forestry all the way down to um, product manufacturing and retailing. And more and more our preference is to finance integrated operations that have both upstream and downstream um, activities along the value chain. Our agribusiness and forestry group represents about 7% of uh, IFC's total uh, financing. So it's not, it's not uh, the largest, but it's also not the smallest. We do about 500 to a billion dollars of financing uh, annually uh, around the world and we've been in the business for 60 years. So we've had our, our shares of uh, challenges and, and successes. One part of the, uh, that experience is getting a, a really firm understanding of project selection, you know, how we evaluate forestry projects, whether it's in the real sector or, or uh, environmental services that I'll talk about later. And I've, I've listed here on the slide the, the different criteria that we use to evaluate investment opportunities. And you'll notice that the, the first uh, item is uh, sponsor quality. So we, we look at the performance and the integrity of the uh, companies that we, uh, we hope to invest in. Land tenure sustainability is a, a huge issue for investments. Obviously, fiber supply, we were seeing a, a steady inc demand for increased fiber. Uh, ENS responsibility, environment and social responsibility. I'll talk a little bit later about our uh, eight performance standards that guide our, um, our uh, responsibility, sustainability responsibility safeguards. And competition, um, competition, investment costs, and investment timing. These are all very detailed financial aspects of investments that uh, our credit uh, group takes uh, very, very seriously. So even though projects um, may have great development stories, if they don't uh, generate returns, then unfortunately we, we uh, either have to work with the company to get to that point or, uh, or walk away. More and more, we're in the business of creating markets. And so some of the examples are climate finance, and I'll talk about later. But another more practical example is are things like product substitution, where we're seeing more and more wood products uh, being developed from planted forests as opposed to, to natural forests. And that's, a, that's an exciting area. So that's our, our first, uh, I guess, tool in, in the toolbox is, is real sector uh, financing. Next one. There's been uh, discussion about bonds. Uh, IFC has uh, been in the green bond business for uh, since 2005. Uh, we've provided um, well, almost $6 billion in green bonds, uh, just recently issued a, a $2 billion green bond. I, I think it's the largest. And all of the uh, proceeds from the green bonds are set aside for investing in things like renewable energy, energy efficiency, and more, uh, more recently, other climate-related uh, projects in developing countries. Um, not quite yet into red investments, but uh, we're hoping that, that that won't be too far along. Um, I hope people understand when we talk about bonds, there's the, the, you know, the green bond is investment in the, in the bond principle. So all of the uh, you know, IFC regularly raises bonds uh, to provide its financing capital. Next slide. A second type of bond, uh, Agus, you mentioned the uh, forest bond. This was a, a bond issued uh, in 2016. And this is a, a very different type of bond. The 
uh, bond principal, the amount, you know, the, the, um, the, the amount of money that investors put into the bond remains uh, within IFC's uh, capital accounts. It's the bond coupon or the annual interest that is provided to bond holders that makes this unique. And in this case, uh, for the forest bond, IFC purchased uh, carbon credits from a red project in uh, Kenya, the Kasagao project, and uh, provided these credits to bond investors as part of their uh, annual coupon or interest payment. And so obviously the, the bond investors were interested in, in the bond to receive those credits. And on the slide, there's a, a flow chart showing the, the different element or components of the bond. Um, you'll notice that we worked with BHP Billiton to really provide uh, support for the bond uh, in case uh, you know in cases where uh, carbon credit prices fluctuate we've decided to continue on with the forest uh, bond and we're, we're looking at projects um, around the world uh, including Indonesia uh, so this is a this is an ongoing kind of an exciting activity for us so those are the three uh, I guess investment or financing tools that I wanted to cover Next slide is, is really some of the challenges and, and new approaches that we see uh, on the horizon. And some of them have been addressed here in, in, uh, in, this, in this conference. And one of them in particular is how we can involve private sector uh, in cooperation with, with the public sector on strengthening red implementation. I, I think we've all agreed, and, and it came up yesterday afternoon that the private, private sector does play an important role in implementing Red Plus. We see in Indonesia, for example, the 17% of NDCs allocated to the forestry sector. Uh, much of that sector is repre represented by production forest. All of that production forest is represented by concession licensing programs uh, by private sector. So a, a very substantial role for private sector in uh, Indonesia's, Indonesia's production forest. And we see that, that similar elsewhere. Article 6 also came up yesterday of uh, the Paris Agreement that really lays out the way uh, uh, private sector can uh, engage with, uh, with government um, in bringing in um, project scale uh, red activities, and uh, I see that this is still a big challenge. Um, for example, Indonesia is starting to address Article 6, particularly Article 6.2 that brings in private sector, but a, a long way to go before providing clarity on linkages between uh, uh, red projects and how uh, they can be nested within uh, national NDC at the same time being able to market carbon credits internationally. And I, I think we, we firmly believe that there is a, a need for both uh, public and private sector roles in, in red. Next, la final slide. Just uh, lessons learned. We keep coming back to the need for strong safeguards. And we've been fortunate in IFC to have a, a very, very I guess we consider it a global benchmark through our eight performance standards. And in red is addressed here, or uh, greenhouse gas emission issues under performance standard three on resource efficiency, and in performance standard six on uh, biodiversity uh, protection. So that I can't emphasize enough how these uh, safeguards uh, dictate just about everything we do in, in our financing work and will continue in the future. Thank you. So thanks very much, Michael, for that. There's one point on your slide I do want to come back to, which is um, you made the point that authorized private entities to develop programs that will generate ERs be nested into national accounting. Um, 
this is one of the big debates about how do you actually do that in a way that decreases the risk for the private sector so that they're not subject to um, an overall accounting rounding up error that wipes out their gains. So we'll come back to that point. Um, I'd now just like to go, uh, I think I actually created a little bit of difficulty in the order of the slides. So I think um, I might actually, Gabe, ask you to, to go next. Whatever you like. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I guess still morning. Uh, my name is Gabriel Eikhoff. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Lestari Capital. Uh, Lestari Capital is a, it's a new company. We're, um, we're the new kids on the block in a lot of ways in the finance space. Um, Lestari is the brainchild of two long-standing uh, companies here in Indonesia, uh, PT Forest Carbon and uh, Diameter Consulting. Um, and we've been working on this model um, called the Sustainable Commodities Conservation Mechanism, or the SCCM. Many of you might have heard of it by now. Um, I know that many of you in the room have actually been very important um, uh, stakeholders in, in consultations that we've had on the SCCM, and um, it's great to see many of you here. Um, because of the, the founding partnership between Diameter and Forest Carbon, the, the background of, um, of the story is really focused in twofold. It's focused, it's focused first on how to help guarantee and secure long-term sustained financing for conservation, restoration, peat rewetting, and village forestry projects on the ground in the real world uh, for a minimum of 20 to 25 years. What we've seen over and over and over again is projects suffering, whether they're NGO or, non or, or for profit uh, projects, suffering with one, two, three year grant or donor funding cycles, and it's exhausting and it's really insecure and it's very hard to create long term conservation planning for a lot of projects this way. On the other side, uh, we are looking to address what we call the demand issue, meaning how do we link consumer goods manufacturing, retailers, growers, the entire commodity sector, not only palm oil, but, but pulp and paper, timber, rubber, cocoa. How do, we, how do we fix the market failure of deforestation in a way in which we're weaving conservation into that, that market failure as a way of correcting the market so that conservation is a fundamental part of production so that you cannot produce without also uh, without also taking conservation and reforestation and rehabilitation into the equation uh, one caveat at the outset the starry capital is not in any way a standard setting body the starry capital does not does not dictate um, the way in which um, we work with consumer goods, consumer goods manufacturers or our clients or, or growers or producers. And we do not dictate the way that we interact with projects. We work entirely within each commodity sector specifically. And we work uh, with, growers uh, with, with growers on one side and with conservation projects on the ground on the other side. We also do not run our own projects. We work only with third-party projects to help uplift the entire conservation community sector. So let me just go on to the next slide, if you can. So the way it works, in, in summary, is we've seen that there's this, there's this emerging demand market for conservation, especially in the commodity space, whether that's from any of the, the demand sources I was talking about before, each of, the different, each of the different market demand sectors have or are, have emerging um, uh, compliance standards built into them. Could you just back up one bit before you get to my, uh, no, 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 back up, back up. Yeah, that's my punchline down there. Can you back up one more, please? Thank you. So we have emerging standards, such as the RSPO's compensation mechanism. You have, you have emerging standard, you have, that's an existing uh, process. You have emerging standards uh, under the FSC, and you have a very nebulous and very uncertain no deforestation uh, commitment issue. 
Whereas the FSC and RSPO are really focused on historical, on, on ameliorating historical deforestation, forward-looking, going, going into the future, we really need to understand how do, we, how do we really tackle the question of zero deforestation and what does that mean? What happens if, if a company has 100 hectares of deforestation in its supply chain? Should Unilever just kick them out of their supply chain? And is that, is that an efficient way to deal with the problem? Because it's going to happen, certainly. It has happened already. So how do we fix that? And, and how do we do that in a, in a very market-friendly, conservation-friendly way that does not in any way incentivize deforestation, which is, does not create a cut-and-pay system, and which is very multi-stakeholder? So we've created, so on the other side of the question, on the other side of the equation, go ahead. Yep, you can go forward now. On the other side of the equation, we're working directly with projects across the country. You might have heard of many of them. Um, we're now, we have now signed letters of intent with 85 projects in Indonesia. Um, most of those are village forestry projects, but they also include ecosystem restoration concessions and wrap carbon and wrap uh, and, and pan carbon uh, concessions. The idea is ultimately to put a financial vehicle between these two sectors of conservation and commodity production to, to generate a way, to generate a platform transparently which manages finance and compensation payments and financing from one side and directs it into long-term sustained payments into the other side. So that projects can be guaranteed, projects know where their funding is going to be coming from five years, ten years from now. And on the other side, the palm oil sector, the retailers, the consumer goods sectors, they know that they have a solid, vetted portfolio of projects that they can work with to help address their, their liabilities, historical or future. Go ahead. Since since, yeah, one more, one more, one more step forward. Since, uh, since the demand sector puts in uh, money on, in, a, in an accelerated pace and payments are made on an annual basis over the long term, that leaves us with, a, with financing in the fund which, is, which can be used for investment. And, and ideally, we're looking at how we can use that specifically for impact investments which generate returns and then one step forward, please. Creates a revolving green fund, effectively, at the center, which is entirely 100% market driven and can also be blended with other types of finance at the same time. This is all meant to generate long term financing, again, for the conservation initiatives on the ground, transparency on the commodity production side. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the quick and dirty. We're, we are supported by the Packard Foundation and the Partnerships for Forests program. So I'm happy to answer more questions later on. Thank you. Just, just um, Gabriel, one important point which you did highlight, but I think to note on, on that fund is that, is that in, in addition, you also bring in other capital into SCCM other investment capital to invest in the underlying assets, which further generates the cycle. I think it's a very important point. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's designed specifically to be able to receive direct liability payments or also investment finance, CSR finance. We've even had one producer come to us and simply say, we have a very large CSR budget. Would you be willing to simply take this budget on and help us identify the portfolio projects where it can go? So it's a very, very, very dynamic vehicle. It's not rigid whatsoever. Okay, thanks for that. Um, okay, so finally, uh, our final speaker is, is Mary Kate Bullen from New Forest. And Mary, you've got a presentation as well, so I hand over to you. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Martin. Um, thank you all for taking the time to sit with us and listen to our views on forest and finance. Very excited to see such a, a good crowd this year at the event. Um, so I'm with New Forest. I think we represent a little bit of a different perspective and type of actor at this year's event. So I just wanted to take a little bit of back time to explain who we are and how we work in the forest sector. 
Um, but what I'd like to talk to you about today is how as sustainable forestry investors, we have deployed capital today, how we currently work, and how we're also looking at uh, mechanisms to both catalyze more capital into sustainable forestry, as well as to create and extend the impacts that we can create by how we work in the region. Go on to the next slide, please. And the next one, sorry. That's one we have to have, thanks to lawyers. Um, so New Forest is a sustainable forestry investment manager also investing in rural land and conservation investments. We were established in 2005 in Australia, so we now have a 12-year track record during which we've built up a portfolio of more than 900,000 hectares of forest and land, as well as a few sawmills in Australia and New Zealand. The way we operate is with regional investment strategies that are targeting very specific opportunities that we match with investor capital from the broader market to invest into forestry. Now, why are they regional strategies and how are we matching? By that, I mean there are different investor requirements when they're looking to place their capital. When it comes to the forest sector, you're gonna get a different return if you invest in the US versus Brazil versus Australia versus Indonesia. Um, so our investment strategies are segmented by geography where we can have very focused teams that are operating origination strategies and actively managing assets in those local markets. Um, as a company, New Forest is largest in Australia and New Zealand where we've got around 500,000 hectares of FSC certified plantations. To get to Martine's earlier question of what would you do with a billion dollars of Red Plus money, I think absolutely, even just the four of us with some uh, extra good support in the room could put that capital to work in three, four years if you gave us the, the broad mandate to do that. Um, and I think particularly when you asked that question, my mind went straight to, don't forget sustainable forest management. There's quite a lot of talk of the side of the conservation, the carbon side, avoided deforestation. But if we open Red Plus and really look at that broader mandate to improve the sustainable forest management of the world's forests, while also engaging in things like reforestation as well as forest conservation, a billion dollars is easily deployable. And my colleagues back in Sydney right now have a spreadsheet of $1.2 billion of investable deals in Southeast Asia alone right now. So it's completely doable. It's just what are we looking to invest in? And at a 5% return, no problem. Um, I think across that spectrum, you'd be able to get production for us. You'd get really cool restoration projects happening. You'd get high-tech new mills creating great products going into the supply chain through the IFC work. It'd be a really dynamic, exciting thing. So I want to put it out there that that's not a crazy question. That's definitely an achievable question. Um, coming back to new forests, how we're acting, particularly in this region, in 2012, we launched the Tropical Asia Forest Fund, which was a $170 million fund from institutional investors. Those are pension funds, um, insurance, reinsurance companies, uh, impact investors, development banks. That's who I mean by institutional investors. Particularly in our Tropical Asia Forest Fund TAF, we've got nine investors. Three of those are Northern European development banks. Two are fund to funds operating in real asset space and four are pensions out of Northern Europe. So these are people looking for very commercial returns for commercial reasons, as well as the development banks who have a mission to support sustainable development in emerging markets. Um, through that fund over four years, we have not deployed a billion dollars. Um, we've spent more than 100 million to invest in three assets, which are shown on this map here. So this is our TAF portfolio. I thought I would just explain quickly what each of those three investments is so that you understand how private forestry investors like us are actually looking to engage with Asia's forest sector. Our first investment in the region is up there in the blue in the Sabah portion of Malaysia. It's Acacia Forest Industries where we're a majority owner alongside uh, the SAFOTA, which is the Sabah Forestry Development Authority. It's a government agency in Sabah. Um, that project is an acacia and eucalyptus plantation generating both saw logs and pulp logs. Um, our investment in that asset is really looking to improve the quality of the forest to address legacy land tenure issues in the region. It's a highly dense populated area with a, a long history of land claims and issues, but also a great potential to improve the productivity of that forest, make it a more valuable operation. Our second investment through TAF is a joint venture in Indonesia and in West Kalimantan that's establishing a new rubber plantation. That plantation is in a highly degraded landscape with neighbors, um, oil palm, a little bit of other pulp and paper, but mostly oil palm, looking to plant more than 30,000 hectares of rubber. It's currently at about 18,000 hectares. They're planting at a tremendous rate and really getting that ground cover back in the right places. Um, our third and final investment in TAF were um, an 85% shareholder with the government of Laos of 15% in a company called Mekong Timber Plantations. 
That plantation was previously established to be a pulp plantation um, by an overseas pulp and paper company. They weren't able to get the scale they needed and the land they needed to justify their establishment of a pulp mill. Instead, we've acquired that plantation and are transitioning it to higher value saw logs and looking to bring in local processing for more value add to happen in Lao in country rather than exporting a lower value product out of the country. So that's a real quick sort of scope of three very different projects, two in sort of tropical hardwoods, one in rubber, both for latex and timber. Go to the next slide. Um, this is a photo of the West Kalimantan rubber project. When I first went there in 2013, very barren, very sad landscape, and at that point there was about 1,000 hectares of trees in the ground, now there's 18,000. So we're able to see what capital is doing to really get reforestation product, projects going into place, taking what was a highly degraded landscape and bringing it back into production. We as fund managers are very active in how we do this. Um, we're not investment managers sitting on Wall Street behind a Bloomberg terminal looking at spreadsheets all day, although we do have a lot of spreadsheets. They're mostly forestry models. We're very on the ground and active in how we operate. And that means our operations teams are at our assets at least once a month, regularly in contact with the teams and providing a great deal of technical assistance and capacity development to those businesses to help them operate better. And by better, I mean in all facets from their financial management through to how they engage with stakeholders to how they manage their environmental risks and opportunities. Through the TAF portfolio, you can see some of the impacts we're anticipated to have over the life of the fund. Um, one of our bright line issues is uh, a zero deforestation policy put forward by conserving all natural forests and promoting all high conservation values. That's absolutely essential and something our investors require of us as well, but also um, it's core to the fabric of how new forest operates. At the end of the fund life, we'll expect that there'll be 60,000 hectares of certified plantations within 150,000 gross hectares. So that means there's 90,000 hectares of other things in those landscapes. Those are communities, it's in Indonesia, it's gonna be a portion of Tanam and Kahitapan livelihood plantings, um, it's natural forest, it's recovering secondary forest, all of those things mixed in a broader landscape. Um, and uh, alone already in that fund, that's 30,000 hectares of reforestation, principally coming from that rubber project. Now, I'm really, really proud of those impacts, but I also know that is a drop in the bucket in terms of what we need to do. So I'm talking, this is 100 million plus of work, four years to invest it. Our big question as we look to continue in Asia is how can we do more? You can go to the next slide. So to do that, we've been having a lot of conversation with a variety of potential partners from foundations to development banks to intergovernmental agencies to um, creative financing initiatives and various folks in the room as well about how we can combine forces to create more impactful investments and to do more of it at a better pace so that we don't take four years to invest $100 million compared to, gosh, in eight years in Australia and New Zealand, we've been able to deploy $2 billion. That's a really big disparity. Um, and so we really know that we need to put, the, put our foot on the gas a little bit and really get on the opportunity that we see here in Asia. Um, so returning to blended finance, which is a term that's come up a few times, I think it was Michael defined it, so I don't have to really, but strategic use of development capital alongside private capital. Um, often these days, people are specifically linking it to trying to achieve the sustainable development goals. So I've put into the colored boxes here some of the different ways we've looked at and are considering and progressing with using blended finance to do more in our forestry investment program going forward in Asia. Um, one opportunity, it's a bit more on the traditional side of how we think about things, is technical assistance or a grant facility, which can help investors overcome some of the barriers to investing sustainably in Asian Pacific forests. There's the pay for performance model, which we heard a little bit about yesterday. Um, you know, examples like Norway looking to make red plus payments for performance. Um, there are others who are looking to do that, potentially from the CSR type perspective, as Gabe mentioned. Um, there's also a unique role for first lots risk capital, which we've seen some of the international funding agencies um, provide as well, which gives investors comfort that if they invest in something a little riskier, they're not going to be the first ones to lose their money because there's going to be another type of capital that was willing to accept that risk because it was worth, that, worth it to them to achieve the impact they were going to. Um, Another one is anchor capital, just giving people the confidence that, hey, this thing is investable and I'm a big company or a big investor and I believe in this. That can encourage other people to come in and a critical role that development capital can play as well. Now, the one that New Forest is really excited about for Asia moving forward, we're developing a model that we're calling around blended equity and performance investment. 
Um, for our next fund, we're looking at having basically two tranches, and I apologize I didn't put this into the, the structure of the PowerPoint because I wasn't sure how detailed we'd get, but this has been a really good detailed conversation so far, where we'll have two types of capital coming in. One from impact investors coming into an impact tranche and what we're calling a mainstream tranche that'll be all those commercial investors that we really want to encourage to come in. By combining those two types of interests, you can keep your fund at the same risk return level overall while having segmented groups, some that are willing to take a higher risk, potentially accept a lower return, as well as those who want lower risk for a steadier return. Now, the way we'll do it with these guys, we've talked about basically as much impact as we achieve, the greater our impact, the lower the impact investors' return will be. If we don't achieve certain additional impacts, if we don't do anything different than we did in our first fund, everybody gets the same return. But the more climate mitigation we provide, the better job quality provide, the more biodiversity we protect, those impact investors will accept impact and combine with finance for their return. Now, I think this is the first time we're hearing this type of model put together for, for Asian forestry. Um, we are having a lot of consultation both with current and prospective investors about it. Um, but to us, it's very exciting because we think it's going to make it easier to get more new investors into emerging markets forestry. We think it's going to make more deals investable. We think it's going to extend the ability of our uh, fund to create impact and really just be the next sort of step change in getting broader impact happening at a faster pace in Southeast Asia. Um, if you go to the next slide. I haven't ended with the standard thank you. This is the sunset over our Indonesian plantation. I think it's just a beautiful landscape. And if you look at it, you can see there's all the sorts of different um, elements of that landscape. There's a HCV area in the background. You've got the foreground as restoration of what was a, um, a sort of burned over grassland prior. Um, and I think it's just emblematic of what we're trying to do to bring landscapes back into production. Um, as we're moving forward, we're really looking to bring private finance into truly high impact sustainable forestry investments. But I want to emphasize that not all of our investors, in fact, nearly none of our investors would come and say, I'm an impact investor. But most investors today want to manage their environmental and social risk, and they want responsible investments. And so that's where providers like New Forest can come in as a fund manager work with companies and governments on the ground and communities who have the access rights and help connect them to the capital that can realize the development plans that align with local national objectives for um, things like climate, biodiversity, and community development. I want to underscore it's completely important that you get a commercial return that is attractive, but that there's a whole bundle of different types of investors out there who are each seeking something slightly different. So the true promise about this blending is that you can combine people who have different objectives into a single fund coming together and everybody gets back out of it what they need. That's what we're looking forward to going forward. Okay, thanks very much. And I think um, just, <laughs> just one important point, which we did pick up on yesterday, but I think you sort of echoed it, is that a number of the NDCs do talk about maintaining a high degree of forest cover. And one way of doing that is basically building a sustainable timber industry. And that can also then feed into a domestic scheme of, of building more buildings out of timber as well. So there's a, there's a good cycle there to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was one thing I wasn't sure if I was going to get into, but a lot of times in the investment world, we hear about forestry as a problem or a risk. People are afraid of deforestation. They're afraid of a social conflict, all these things that rightly need a lot of attention to manage. Um, but my personal mission is to put Forest Forward as a solution. Their climate solution, their sustainable development solution, their building and material solution, and more and more there's um, this growing bioeconomy, we call it, where it's not just even you know, building houses out of timber, it's the clothes you wear. Uh, I guarantee you someone in here is wearing a shirt made out of trees, which is kind of bizarre. Um, there's also new biomaterials innovation that's happening through wood fiber opens up a whole world um, that timber products and other fibers can provide while we move away from fossil fuels to give us things like polyesters and plastics. Um, so that whole substitution side is very important. And um, there's a great stat, I think, from WWF that by 2050, we're going to need three times as much wood every year from the world. So that's what we need in 2050. Today it's, what, 2018. We need to think now about where that wood is coming from. That means planting more forests. It means making forests more productive and how they're managed, um, as well as conserving those that are able to be conserved and restored over time. Okay. Well, thanks very much. 
Um, I would open up for questions, but we're actually running quite a bit behind, so I'm going to end the panel here and, and hand over to Juan, who's going to do the next panel. So if you can just thank our panellists.